19th century than the 19th and 20th century. Another point about this new 19th century press was that it wasn't in the main political. Um, previously, newspapers had been published mainly for purposes of propaganda. During the English Revolution, the courants um, were printed either by the royalist side in the, Civil War, in the English Civil War or by the parliamentary side uh, to give very, very biased um, uh, reports of the progress of the Civil War, accounts of battles and so on, uh, and accounts of atrocities on the other side. Uh, there was some commercial press um, after that in the 18th century. Um, but I, it was still, uh, you know, like Wilkes's paper, the North Britain, um, these things were, 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 were um, really for, um, very often for politics or, or, or for spreading religious ideology and so on. Um, the press of the 19th century is a business. Um, these papers are being established locally and nationally. And there was another huge boom in London of uh, what were called class papers, meaning uh, trade papers for each profession. So the brewers would have a daily paper called the Morning Advertiser, for example. I think it's still going. Uh, butchers would have one, bakers, candlestick makers, sort of magazine or weekly trade press. Um, that was all commercial because if you were, uh, you know, the Morning Advertiser, uh, and you were selling it to people who owned inns, it would all be, uh, the, the economics of that is that you would be selling, um, you know, beer equipment or, or, or whatever in, in the advertising. Um, so that was very different. The press in the French Revolution and the American Revolution had likewise been uh, not commercial. It made a loss, but it was subsidised uh, by the government or by... Uh, the revolutionary parties, the Jacobins in the French Revolution had their own press um, and produced a great many pamphlets uh, and these things uh, in the French Revolution played a role in the terror actually because the whole spy mania and the whole culture of uh, denouncing people um, as working against the revolution and working for foreign governments trying to overthrow the revolution and therefore ending up in the guillotine uh, that kind of mass hysteria that we sometimes see even today, you know, in the worst excesses sometimes of the tabloid press um, of, um, you know, mass panic. Uh, that had been a characteristic of the press in the French Revolution. OK, I'm turning to my notes now for details on the demographics of England during this time. Between 1750 and 1800, the population had crept up from about 8 million to 10 million in round numbers. But in the 50-year period, the same length of time, between 1800 and 1850, the population doubled from roughly 10 million to 20 million. Then it doubled again between 1850 and 1900, so that in... Uh, Round numbers, it was round about 40 million by 1900. The age structure was changing, the population was getting younger, so that by 1821, almost half the whole population of England was under 19 years of age. Now, whereas the population of England as a whole was growing rapidly, the population of its cities was growing even faster because this was a time, and we've discussed this in connection with the work of Cobbett, uh, rural rides and so on, corn laws and, uh, and that whole uh, business of the destruction of English agriculture following the Napoleonic Wars, that, uh, in, so that in 1811, almost 40% of the population, uh, two in every five people, worked in agriculture. By 1901, that had dropped to less than... 10%, um, that's a pretty smooth curve through the, the century, although the dip, the, the dip in the 1820s and 1830s um, in the proportion involved in agriculture is quite steep. So the population is, is, is doubling between 18, um, 1800 and 1850, but because of the simultaneous movement of this larger population from the countryside to the cities, 
the cities, if you like, are quadrupling in size on average. And uh, the newer cities, such as Manchester, are, are, are growing uh, by factors of 10. Uh, and so you get this huge concentration of this uh, young, growing English population, uh, which is becoming increasingly urban. Now, that's very important for newspapers because um, it's rather difficult to distribute a newspaper around the countryside. But if you've got London with millions of people in it, suddenly you've got um, a ready market. Also, urban people... Um, are much more hungry for news um, in all kinds of ways. I mean, things in the countryside have a, a very slow rhythm to them. They have the harvest and all, all that sort of thing. But uh, the cities are always, uh, particularly the Victor early Victorian cities, of course, they're always full of disasters and explosions and cra train crashes and crime and all the rest of it, all the things that news is about. So the population doubles, the city put density quadruples, uh, and the kind of hunger for news goes up by a fa you know a massive factor uh, on top of that as well. So, so that's the underlying demographics. Now, s s many of the people in the cities are desperately poor, um, and some of them uh, are also still illiterate. But when you look at the data there, the picture is more complicated. That's pretty widespread. Illiteracy in the first half of the 19th century, literacy might have even gone up as a proportion of the population uh, uh, over the um, preceding century. Uh, historians of the early 20th century tended to overestimate illiteracy. They used to think fewer people could read in the past than actually was the case. Uh, in the 17th and 18th century, literacy was pretty high because of the church, um, that in order to read the Bible... Uh, you, you had to read, and so uh, the churches were very active in teaching people to read. Now, as the population grew, though, in the 19th century, particularly people pouring into the cities, uh, they tended to lose contact in the first part of the century with the churches, um, which is why in the second part of the 19th century you have church missions all over the place to try and re-Christianise uh, parts of the, you know, the poorer parts of London and uh, Manchester and places like that. So illiteracy probably increased in the first uh, couple of decades of the 19th century as attempts to teach children to read were outstripped by the raw growth of the population. So, I mean, that was addressed in, eight, in the 1870s by the first Education Acts, which uh, stipulated, uh, sort of which provided what were called board schools. They were... Um, publicly funded schools in every borough, including in working class areas. So after 1870, uh, you, you achieve virtual universal literacy in, uh, in England. So when those people, we're now talking right at the other end of the, the end of the 19th century, the dawn of the 20th century, really, that children who went to the board schools in the 1870s uh, joined the adult population in their 20s just in the 1890s, if you just do the arithmetic there. So by 1890, you have almost universal literacy, and that leads to a yet another boom in newspapers and the launch of newspapers that, 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 such as the Daily Mirror uh, and, uh, above all, the, the Daily Mail, which gives us our contemporary newspaper press. But So you can see all the time the, the size of the population, its concentration, its hunger for news its ability to buy newspapers and its literacy is what's shaping the industry all the time. It's the, it's the demographics of the underlying force. But uh, in 1840, which I've got data for here, uh, 